Want to buy a Honda? Car? Outboard? Lawn mower? Maybe a robotic one? Trimmer? Sprayer? Leaf blower? Generator? ATV? Side by side? Mountain bike? Actual robot? Honda makes them all. The company even makes jets which are reasonably priced, or as reasonably priced as jets can be, and reliable, which they better be. Sadly, I'm not in the market. But all this started with motorcycles and a dream. Literally, that's what the first Honda motorcycle was called. And a man who was a bit of a wild genius. Because it takes a wild genius to accomplish big things, and Soshiro Honda belongs to that club. An engineer, a visionary, and chance taker, the young Soshiro went from being a mechanic to founding a company which built piston rings for Toyota, among other companies. After World War II, with Japanese roads and infrastructure in tatters, Soshiro sold his piston ring business and embarked on a new venture with businessman Takeo Fujisawa. Their goal? To provide the Japanese people with cheap, reliable transportation capable of traversing Japan's damaged road system. And the rest is history. It's funny to think that an iconic company like Triumph was producing motorcycles four years before Soshiro Honda was born. Yet in his lifetime, he managed to build a company that not only sold more motorcycles than any other brand, but basically killed the British motorcycle industry. It's a great story, so stay tuned, and if you find this content valuable, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps the video be recommended by the YouTube algorithm. Like many a good story, the history of Honda began with tragedy and opportunity. The tragedy of World War II led Soshiro Honda to recognize the need for inexpensive transportation. And so he purchased a large number of World War II surplus two-stroke generator motors and repurposed them by grafting them onto bicycle frames. Once the supply of motors was exhausted, Soshiro founded Honda Motor Company Limited with Takeo Fujisawa and started designing a motorcycle in 1948. The Honda Model D, D for Dream, a 98cc two-stroke motorcycle was introduced a year later. By 1951, after being generally annoyed by the noise and fumes of Japanese two-stroke motorcycles, Honda introduced the Dream E, a 146cc four-stroke model. A year later, the company made a return to two-stroke production by building 50cc bicycle clip-on motors and selling them through thousands of bicycle shops. The motor's name? The Cub F. An inauspicious beginning to the Cub name which would eventually become the greatest trademark in not just motorcycling but motor vehicle history. Later in the 50s, Soshiro Honda made it publicly known that his intention was to enter motorcycle racing and compete with the oldest and most established brands in motorcycling. In 1959, Honda first sent a team to the Isle of Man TT to compete in the 125cc ultra lightweight class. Their top rider finished 6th, but the team won the manufacturer's class. They went back to Japan and back to the drawing board determined to improve. Two years later they returned with Mike Halewood who won the 125cc class. Honda also finished 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th. Halewood also won the 250cc class. And Honda finished 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th. It's hard to underestimate the impact of these wins on the motorcycling world. Imagine that a company that started from scratch 12 years ago in a country devastated by war went to the Isle of Man TT today and not only won two competitive classes but completely dominated them. The Isle of Man examiner stated, it was a devastating win for the Orient. And it was far from the last one. As this was going on, Honda was determined to break into the richest market in the world and began importing its small displacement Super Cub into the United States. At the time, in the US, motorcycling was seen as an anti-social activity, the purview of hooligans and undesirables who would roll into your town and cause havoc. Honda needed a strategy to break into the mainstream and settled on an unconventional one. They weren't going to advertise in typical motorcycle magazines or even use the word motorcycle. They would focus on mainstream media and attempt to show Americans that motorcycling was for everyone. The You Meet the Nicest People on a Honda campaign created by Gray Advertising is considered among the most successful advertising campaigns of all time. It combined vibrant colors with images of wholesome folks on Honda bikes and changed Americans and the world's view of motorcycling, making the activity socially acceptable for people who didn't grease their hair or wear leather jackets. Honda even sponsored the Academy Awards, the first non-American company to do so, and sales, which were brisk already, exploded. 
One of Sushiro Honda's most interesting characteristics was his stubbornness, which most notably manifested itself in his insistence on forging ahead with racing four-stroke motors even when pitted against the seemingly insurmountable power and weight advantage of two-strokes. Honda correctly predicted that four strokes were going to be the future and in the mid 60s when the competition turned to two stroke motors and 250cc class, Honda built a 250cc six cylinder four stroke race bike called the 3RC164. The bike wasn't immediately successful but Mike Halewood eventually won back to back GP championships on it in 1966 and 67. The late 60s were an important time for Honda. In 1968 the company produced its 10 millionth motorcycle and in 69 it introduced the CB750, one of the most disruptive motorcycles of all time. At a time when twin cylinder Harleys, Triumphs and BSAs ruled heavyweight motorcycle sales and it was accepted that motorcycles leaked oil and sometimes started and sometimes didn't, the CB750 was a revelation. Not only was it more reliable than the established brands, it was lighter, came with the first ever front disc brake, had a superbike level 67 horsepower and could hit 200 km per hour or 125 miles per hour bone stock. It established the inline four cylinder as the engine architecture for the UJM, Universal Japanese Motorcycle, and set a new bar for what a motorcycle should be. Honda raced a version of the bike called the CR750 in the Daytona 200 in 1970. And won. That's one way to capture the imagination of the American public. The CB750 is largely credited with killing Triumph and BSA and almost doing the same to Harley which teetered on the verge of oblivion for the next two decades and had to be rescued repeatedly from the big bad competition from the east. Needless to say, Honda sold a mess of CBs and various displacements and continues to do so today. Honda continued its racing success in the 70s when Gary Jones won the AMA motocross championship on a CR250, perhaps the best dirt bike of the era. In 1974, the Honda Goldwing was introduced, raising the bar for technology and innovation in touring motorcycles. The Goldwing has since become one of the most beloved names in motorcycling, with an army of devoted riders obsessed with piling big miles on their bikes. The 80s rolled around and Honda continued to win races with Freddie Spencer taking the 500cc World Championship in 1983. Three years later, the VFR, one of Honda's most iconic bike lines, was introduced. These V4 motorcycles are generally acknowledged as some of the greatest bikes of all time with bulletproof motors thanks to gear-driven overhead cams. In the 90s, Honda continued refining the VFR while also developing their inline-4 motorcycles. Perhaps the most impressive of these was the Fireblade, which combined the power of a leader bike with the size of a 600 and absolutely obliterated its competition by raising the performance bar so high. Valentino Rossi ushered in the new millennium for Honda by winning the last 500cc two-stroke MotoGP championship in 2001 and the first 990cc four-stroke championship in 2002. Four years later, Honda sold its 50 millionth Super Cub, the highest selling motor vehicle of all time. Four years after that, the company introduced its DCT automatic transmission and has become a leader in this technology offering many DCT models throughout its lineup. And lately Honda has led the way in the resurgence of the mini-moto scene with a wide range of models including its current highest seller, the Grom. Check out my mini-moto shootout video in the top right corner. It's been a long haul for the most successful motor company in history. The chances that Soshiro Honda took in building and expanding to new markets could very well have sank the company, and there definitely were plenty of setbacks. But it takes a wild man to take those chances and Soshiro was definitely one of those. The stories of his crazy nights with sake and geisha abound, and his brilliance, drive and daring paved the way for his enormous success. So where does Honda stand today? It is the largest and highest selling manufacturer of two-wheeled motor vehicles of all time. Not only that, Honda was again the world's largest seller in 2021 by moving 13.8 million bikes in the first 11 months of the year. One in three motorcycles and scooters sold around the world is a Honda. The company has also sold over 100 million Super Cubs and variants, the highest selling vehicle of all time. It has numerous racing wins across various racing classes including stunning recent success in the Dakar Rally. It's a leader in automatic motorcycles and the mini motosphere as well. The list of iconic models from Honda is long and varied. Besides the Cubs, CBs, Goldwings, VFRs, mini motos and Fireblades which I already mentioned, 
There are wild bikes like the Blackbird which at one time was the world's fastest motorcycle. There's also the Fury, the only factory chopper currently made by a major manufacturer, the Africa Twin, one of the top selling adventure bikes on the planet, the XR and CRF lines leading the off-road charge, and then there are the scooters which make up a huge portion of Honda's worldwide sales. Of the four major Japanese manufacturers, Honda is considered the most premium. Their bikes have the highest quality finishes and tend to be priced higher than the competition. One criticism is that Honda plays down the middle, attempting to appeal to the greatest number of consumers, which results in bikes that don't stand out. Some even call Hondas boring. Really? The Valkyrie, especially the Rune, the Fireblade, the Blackbird, the VFR, the Fury, hell, the CB750? All of those bikes were revolutionary in their own way and all went out on a limb. Honda seems to do things its own way, not paying much attention to the trends followed by others. The XR line stubbornly stuck to four strokes in the face of two stroke competition for decades and made it work. Honda's 300cc bikes, actually 286cc, are smaller than the competition. Honda also made a line of 471cc motorcycles smack dab between the 300 and 650 classes which basically have no competitors. The Africa Twin sits in the middle between the larger 12 to 1300cc adventure bikes and the mid-sized 7 to 900cc ones and Honda stubbornly refuses, at least thus far, to give us a smaller one or a Trans Alp. Finally, the Rebels are a line of cruisers that do not use V-twin engines and yet sell well. When you're the 800 pound gorilla, you set the trends, not follow them. So there's a brief history of one of the most storied motorcycle manufacturers and it had better be brief because an in-depth one would have required a 4 hour video. Today Honda is effectively the world's most widespread and well known motorcycle brand and shows no signs of slowing down. And even though the company is now selling other products, it will always be associated with a two-wheeled lifestyle. Whatever kind of riding you do, there's a Honda which will meet your needs. Which Hondas are your favorite and what models should the company build in the future? Share your thoughts in the comments. I'm still hoping for a CRF 450L rally, though I'm not holding my breath. Thanks for watching and ride safe out there. If you're interested in any of the gear that Brooke and I wear or use, or the camera equipment we use to film this channel, the links are below. Everything listed there was bought with our own money and we are not sponsored by any company. However, the links below are affiliate links and the channel is paid a small amount for referring you to shop at no additional cost to you. We do not recommend any products that we are not satisfied with ourselves, but we do strongly urge you to do your research and select the correct size for items like helmets and clothing. As always, thanks for watching, your support is greatly appreciated. Please hit that subscribe button, give the video a thumbs up and leave a comment below. And whatever you ride, enjoy it. Wave at other bikers no matter what they're riding, we're all part of a brotherhood and sisterhood. Keep the rubber side down, shiny side up, and may the spokes be with you.